Hi, everybody. My name is Rafa Lombardino, and this is Translation Confessional. I'm sure you've heard that Audible is the leading library for audiobooks, right? But have you given it a try yet? There are literally hundreds of thousands of titles you can choose from, and you'll be saving tons of money if you sign up for a premium account. For $14.99 a month, you get one credit to download any book you want, whose price tag is usually around 20 bucks or so. Right there, you'd be saving money and keeping up with your book addiction at the same time. They have books in different languages too, and some classics are for free, so you don't have to apply your monthly credit to it. You just download the audiobook and enjoy it. And that goes without saying that they have some exclusive content read by incredible actors. So if you close your eyes, it really feels like you're at a theater listening to a play on stage. On top of that, you can also check out the latest trending podcasts. And yes, you can listen to Translation Confessional on Audible too. If you're not yet sure whether Audible is right for you, I dare you to give it a try. Get a 30-day trial and enjoy your first book for free. But I bet you'll get hooked on it and add audiobooks to your routine. Make sure you use the link in this episode's description so they'll know Translation Confessional sent you their way. Then come back to me and let me know what books you're listening to. I hope you enjoy it. Collaborating with authors. I've talked about my work with fiction and nonfiction books in past episodes, and even mentioned how I had to turn to audiobooks as a reader because I was only able to read and reread the books I was actually translating. Today, I wanted to go a little deeper into my collaboration with book authors because it's a mesmerizing process. As I mentioned in Season 1, Episode 39, working side-by-side side with the people who wrote the books I'm translating is what keeps me going. It's great to have an opportunity to discuss war choices and spend a little bit of time inside an author's brain where an entire universe was first created. It all starts after that first contact, whether I found the author's information somewhere or they've reached out to me after getting a referral from another translator who knows my work. What I like to do is offer them a sample, so I read some pages and select a few paragraphs. I use a two-column table to organize the material. The original is on the left, and the translation is on the right. Sometimes I add a few notes if any questions come up during my initial read and work on the sample. Because I often translate from Portuguese to English when it comes to fiction and nonfiction books, the first question I find myself asking is whether the book will go through domestication or foreignization in translation. In other words, Will the book sort of conform to the target language and culture, or will it keep the original flavor, so to speak? For example, I translated a book called Totonia, which chronicles the struggles of a domestic violence survivor in Angola. In the translation, the book was kept foreign to English readers, so they could learn more about Angolan languages, social dynamics, culture, and rituals. The original was written by Rosária da Silva in Portuguese and Bantu languages, and it was a real challenge because the book is very oral, for lack of a better word, and it depicts different styles of speech. There's Angolan Portuguese, there's Broken Portuguese, there's Kit Talk in Portuguese, and there's a variety of Bantu expressions peppered here and there most of which were capped in the original with some equivalents in English worked into the dialogue for contextualization. 
The author also provided a brief introduction about the differences between oral Portuguese in Angola and what is considered standard Portuguese. And there's a little glossary at the end of the book with some added information on some expressions that are relevant to the plot. We're currently looking for a publisher for Totonia to come to life in English. And I hope I have news on that front in the near future, so I can have an episode dedicated to negotiating publication rights on behalf of authors and share a link to the book so you can read it in English. For now, you can go to the link I left in this episode's description because it has a little intro, some sort of a translator's note that I'm reading on screen, and a little bit of a dialogue that sets the scene on what the book is about. Before we continue, let me tell you a bit about Squarespace. I've been using it for both my corporate and my professional websites, and it's made a world of difference for my business. First of all, it saves me a lot of time because their web designing platform is so easy to use. I don't have to figure things out. I just add different elements to a page, check if it looks pretty, and publish it. I can move things around quickly and adjust my homepage as needed, so I can let you know about my upcoming classes, webinars, and speaking events. I've added different sections to the menu too as my content has started to grow, and everything is organized perfectly. Besides, Squarespace allows me to see what each page will look like in different formats, whether people are visiting my website on a computer, tablet, or smartphone. That way, I can make sure nothing looks clunky and everyone can get the information they need in a visually pleasant way. I can also check out some behind-the-scenes information to confirm that my outreach efforts are working. I can see where the traffic to my website is coming from, what keywords visitors used on Google searches to get to my content, and where in the world my audience is located which is perfect when I want to explore some opportunities with translation clients in different markets. If you don't have a professional website yet, or if your current setup has let you down, I know for a fact that Squarespace is exactly what you need to recreate your business image and your brand so clients can find you. To give Squarespace a try and get 10% off your hosting plan, go to this webpage bit.ly slash t3 dash Squarespace. That way, they'll know that you've heard about them here at Translation Confessional. Once again, the webpage is bit.ly slash t3 dash S-Q-U-A-R-E-S-P-A-C-E. Hope you like it. On the other end of the spectrum, we have books that go through domestication. I have an example of that too, and it's a young adult book I've worked on very recently. It's called A Esposa do Rei, which in English became The King's Wife. One funny thing about this is that I suggested a less literal title when I first submitted my sample to author Miriam Okuno. The book cover shows a woman holding a sword. So I thought that maybe we should focus the title in English on her, not on the king. In Portuguese, the word esposa, or wife, appears first in the title. So she's the subject, and do rei, or of the king, acts like a complement to the subject. In English, the word king comes first, and the possessive, almost makes it look like the wife is just an appendage, you know? Maybe it's the feminist in me, but I initiated our negotiation by suggesting that we shift the focus of the title to the wife. The author was open to that suggestion, but once I finished my first draft, I knew why the book title had to be kept literal. The fact that the main character is called the king's wife over and over again, would really tick her off, and it contributed to her picking up the sword in the first place, as we see it on the cover of the book. This is the kind of thing that you can get from a sample or a summary, 
you must read the entire book or translate it in my case so you can get the bigger picture and make those informed decisions. So The King's Wife is the book I had the most fun translating so far. And I had my share of interesting books under my belt. But in this case, the characters made me fall in love with the story and the collaboration I had with Median really made this book special. As I'm working on a book, I always take notes to have some sort of guide for when I'm ready to reread everything and work on the final version that will be delivered to the author. These notes may be about word choices, questions I want to ask before making a language decision, or some curiosities I come across while researching something. With The King's Wife, I found myself taking more notes than usual because I could see how helpful the author's feedback was every time I delivered a chapter to her. Also, it does help that I use a CAD tool to translate books because I get to identify similar sentences throughout the book and add keywords to my glossary to ensure consistency. And believe me, you can find matches and repetitions in some creative projects, not only in technical ones. For example, The King's Wife has an additional chapter that retells the main parts of the story from another character's point of view. So while I had to adjust some of the wording to make it sound more sophisticated and match the new narrator style, the dialogues had to be identical to what had been presented earlier in the book. Besides that, working on a book translation using a cat tool allows me to have a side-by-side preview and go sentence by sentence when I'm done with the first draft. So as I'm reading the Word document with my translation, going through my notes, and leaving little comments and questions for the author, I can also go back to the CAT tool preview and see the original on the left and my translation on the right. But going back to the domestication issue, The King's Wife isn't really about a Brazilian story. It's more like a universal one. I'm being careful not to spoil it for anyone here. However, there were a couple of very Brazilian things in there, and I had to discuss it with the author to come up with a domesticated solution. The first thing I came across was suco de caju, which is cashew juice. I mean, cashew nuts are very popular worldwide, but cashew juice, not so much. Just mentioning it brought back sweet memories from my childhood, and once in a while I still pick up a bottle at a Brazilian market so I can make myself some cashew juice at home. The other very Brazilian element was pastel. And no, for those of you who speak Spanish, pastel is not pastel or cake. It's something we buy in Brazil at food stands, usually at the farmer's market. Those are actually the best ones. It's made of this flaky dough that is kind of unique, and it has different kinds of fillings, cheese or ground beef being the most popular of them. And then it's deep fried into a delicious, crunchy treat. Well, I'm salivating here. (laughs) Well, it's not something you can find everywhere, unless you happen to have a Brazilian market or restaurant nearby. So I knew we'd have to adapt it into something else, not to make the king's wife be actually from Brazil. Well, in sum, this was really a hands-on collaboration, and Meeting and I feel that we wrote the English version of the book together. Because we made these decisions after exchanging a lot of emails and leaving little notes to each other as comments on the Word document we were working on. If you'd like to learn more about this collaboration in particular, I'd like to invite you to head on over to YouTube and watch my interview with her. It has subtitles in English, so don't forget to turn it on in case you don't speak Portuguese. I bet that the solutions we found for cashew juice and pastel will surprise you. And what about you? Have you translated books while collaborating with an author? Let me know how your experience was. 
I always love to hear from other translators who had a chance to collaborate with authors. Send me an email at rlombardino at wordawareness.com or leave a voice message on my anchor page. If I get enough feedback and voice messages, I can go back to the subject and post a special podcast episode with everyone's opinion on this very same theme. By the way, my anchor page is anchor.fm slash translation dash confessional. I look forward to hearing from you. Stay tuned for weekly episodes and subscribe to Translation Confessional through your favorite podcast app.